and Father Sean Pine with Mercy Minutes. The great centrality of the Jubilee Year of Mercy is the Sacrament of Mercy, going to confession. If you haven't been to confession, do please go to confession, return to the sacrament. Beautiful, beautiful embrace where we pour out our misery into the infinite mercy of God, the heart of God, and thus experience great joy, and then we can be merciful to others. To help make a better confession, one is get in touch with sin in your life. We are all, we are all sinners. Mother Teresa went to confession every week, and she had some sins to say, so certainly we who are less can find some. Number two, get in touch with who you approach. You really you don't approach the priest. You're approaching Christ, who is present in the priest, who continues to absolve sins today in 2016. Get in touch with who you offend. In confession and in, in sinning, we're really offending God. First and foremost, sin is against God. And number three or four, we need to get out of touch with sin. And so when we go to confession after a diligent examination of conscience to confess all our mortal sins in kind and number, what kind of sin, not details, but what the nature of the sin was and how many times we did it, as well as adding venial sins or confessing venial sins if that's all we have, we should make a firm purpose of amendment, a plan to try to get out of these sins into the future. And so to examine how we fell into them and avoid the near occasion of sin, person, place, or thing that might be leading me to sin. Finally, experience the joy of the embrace of the Lord and go and sin no more. Tell the people I love them, tell the people I care, when they feel far away from me, tell the people I'm there. Hello and welcome to Tell the People, a program about our Catholic faith with news and information in and around the Catholic Diocese of Lafayette. I'm Trista Littell, and in today's show, Father Kevin Bordelon interviews newly ordained priest, Father Michael Richard. In this segment, What It Means to be Catholic, Father Clinton Sensat continues our Year of Mercy series in his talks about indulgences. And Bishop Douglas Desitel is here to be with you in our last segment, but first, Catholic news on this July 3rd weekend. The Sarah Club of Lafayette will be holding its monthly Holy Hour for Vocations for the spiritual renewal of all priests. The monthly Holy Hour is held on the first Monday of the month from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. at St. Patrick Catholic Church, located at 406 East Pinhook Road in Lafayette. The Sarah Club objectives are to foster and promote vocations to the Catholic priesthood and religious life and to encourage its members to fulfill their own Christian vocations to service. Food for the Journey is a monthly lunchtime speaker series designed to help Catholics live out our faith in our daily lives. The event is held on the first Tuesday of each month at the Wyndham Garden Lafayette, formerly the Hotel Acadiana at 1801 West Pinhook Street in Lafayette. The program begins just after 12 noon with the speaker's presentation from about 12.10 to 12.45 p.m. An optional lunch is $12. It's a lunch buffet and it's available beginning at 11.30 a.m. The cost is $12 and it includes the meal, dessert, drink, and tip. All are welcome to come eat and be fed. The Diocese Office of Justice and Peace, along with the diaconate aspirants for the permanent diaconate, is organizing the collection of school supplies for children whose parents are incarcerated. Your generosity will provide the means to accomplish our mission to be sensitive and generous to those in most need, especially the children who struggle with other special circumstances. What can you do? Purchase items needed for elementary and junior high students and drop off at the Office of Justice and Peace at the Catholic Diocese of Lafayette, 1408 Carmel Drive in Lafayette. The drop-off deadline is July 17th. For more information, please call 261-5545. The Museum of the Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist at 914 St. John Street in Lafayette will host an art exhibit featuring the works of Jean Medol, a 19th century 
French artist from July 1st through October 31st. Jean Madol was a calligrapher, a miniaturist, and a writer classified among the best religious painters in the mid-19th century. Between 1836 and 1863, his art was popular. The exhibit presents reproductions of 10 original religious paintings, several signed and dated 1843 from an unfinished album by Jean Medoul, which was discovered only recently. 2016 is the premier viewing of these paintings. The reproductions are available in a limited edition of 100 framed 11 inch by 20 inch with matte and non-glare glass in the original size of the paintings. The reproductions are also available in a limited edition of 250 framed 8 by 10 inch with non-glare glass in a reduced size of the original paintings. For more information call 662-6688 for viewing and availability. This is a great summertime event to tour the St. John Cathedral Museum. Last year's first ever Fête de Détache Eucharistic boat procession in honor of the arrival of the Acadians and the 250th anniversary of the St. Martin de Tours Catholic Church in St. Martinville was a great success. It has been decided the Eucharistic boat procession will be an annual event. The next Fête de Détache Eucharistic boat procession is coming up. Please spread the word. Schedule your vacation day for Monday, August 15th, the Feast of the Assumption, and bring your family. Bishop Douglas Desitel will begin the day with Mass at 8 a.m. at St. Leo the Great in Leonville. Then a Eucharistic boat procession travels down Bayou Tesh. The procession will make several prayerful stops for the Rosary and Benediction in Orneville, Cecilia, Brobridge, Parks, and it arrives at St. Martinville at 5 p.m., ending in St. Martinville at Our Lady of Sorrows, Mate Dolorosa Chapel for Vespers and Benediction. Follow Fête de Detest Eucharistic Boat Procession activity on our Facebook or call 394-6550. And that's Catholic News for this week. Coming up next, Father Kevin Bordelon interviews newly ordained priest, Father Michael Richard. Good morning and welcome back to Tell the People. We're happy to be joined today by Deacon Michael Richard. Deacon Richard is about to be ordained a priest for our diocese two days away from ordination. That's and right. so we're happy to, to have you share a little bit about your, your story you know, where you grew up, a little bit about your family, maybe when the idea of priesthood first started to surface in your thoughts and your prayers, and, you know, how it is that here you are two days away from being a priest. Yeah, it's coming. Um, I grew up in Brobridge. I'm the youngest of four, and okay. we went to Catholic school all our life and um, went to church, said our prayers at night, and kind of, in my mind, led a normal Catholic life. And so in that sense, you see priests. I was an altar server. You're familiar with them. But I never wanted to be one mm -hmm. growing up because I knew a priest didn't have a wife. He didn't have kids. I said, well, that's, that's not for me then. So mm -hmm. um, that was certainly how I treated it growing up as a you know, young child, even probably through beginning of high school. But it wasn't until really my relationship with the Lord began to grow uh, through my years at St. Thomas More and the influences I had there and some incredible people uh, in my mm -hmm. life that I began to think differently about it. And the Lord began to kind of form my mm -hmm. heart um, to see the beauty okay. of the priesthood. So during the high school years, there was a little bit of a change in attitude, and, and mm -hmm. that possibility became a little bit more real? Absolutely. Okay. And so did you go to seminary right after high school? I thought about it. Okay. Uh, the idea crossed my mind. I went on one vocation retreat mm -hmm. in high school, but ultimately decided to go to LSU. Mm -hmm. And I, I went there for college and got very involved in the Catholic Center. Uh, and really fell in love there, really grew a lot there. And over that time, discerned and went on a lot more retreats and I grew in prayer and, and just kind of grew as a person during those years at LSU. And it was not until the very end of my time at LSU, even though I had some other plans for grad school, uh, mm -hmm. the Lord made it very clear to me um, His desire and His yeah. will um, within my own heart to become a priest. Okay. And so you applied to seminary 
with the Diocese of Lafayette, and, and where did that take you? So from graduating from LSU, I moved to St. Ben's in Covington, did two years of philosophy there, and then from there uh, moved a little bit further south to New Orleans, and I did mm -hmm. four years of theology at Notre Dame Seminary. Okay, so six years of seminary after the full four-year four degree college, that's right. at LSU. So a lot of study, a lot of preparation, yes. and here you are two days away from, from priesthood. So as you anticipate that, uh, mm -hmm. becoming a priest, serving at St. Mary Magdalene Parish in Abu, right? That's your first assignment. Yeah. What are some of the things that you are most uh, eager to do, that you're uh, most excited about? I think uh, one of them is to not be in the classroom. Right. Uh, I think I just finished the 23rd grade uh, right. straight through. And so, so to, to be in the parish, to be with the people, um, is really a desire on my heart. And, and I look forward to kind of being there year round, not just in mm -hmm. a couple summer months. Um, but to be with the people, also to be involved in Abbeville. Um, Vermilion Catholic is there in the high school. Uh, and so to get involved in those kinds of things, in the life of the parish, the life of the people, um, mm -hmm. it's very exciting to me. Yeah. And we know that uh, Pope Francis has called for this extraordinary jubilee year of mercy. Mm -hmm. And so have you given any thought to the significance of being ordained a priest during this year of mercy where the church focuses in a particular way this, this aspect of her mission that's really at the heart of, of, of what we're all about? Yeah. Yeah, I think listening to the Pope over, the, over this past year and, and kind of reading the things, and there's been a lot of discussion about mercy and, and what that is, um, to see mercy through the hands of a priest and how much a priest uh, brings mercy really became alive to me this year over mm -hmm. meditating through this, this jubilee. And so I think that's really exciting to be ordained uh, in that year of mercy. Certainly priests mm -hmm. um, bring the Eucharist, but they also bring reconciliation and anointing. Right. Um, so, I think so healing, change, transformation, not just mm -hmm. a kind of oh, it doesn't matter what you're doing, but that there's a reality that God can change what, what we're about, can give us new life. Sure. And, and certainly that happens in a particular way mm -hmm. through the sacraments. Right, and that's, and that's the mission of the priest, to bring that to the people. And so uh, it's very exciting. Right. Yeah. So as you anticipate ordination, we know that during that rite, uh, immediately after the bishop lays hands upon you, says the consecratory prayer, mm -hmm. that you become a priest, that you are configured to Christ the head, Right? And so after that, immediately after that, you take on the vestments of the priest because you are a priest. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, um, we choose someone who has been important to us in our, in our journey, in our formation. And so maybe you could tell us a little bit about who you've chosen to, to vest you as a priest. Yeah, the priest who will vest me is Father Bill Blanda. So mm -hmm. he's the pastor at St. Peter's in New Iberia. And before that, he was at Mary Magdalene in Abbeville. In my very first summer as a seminarian, I was assigned to Abbeville for a summer assignment, and under, under him, I really grew in what, what the priesthood is, to really see that firsthand, uh, and that was an incredible experience for me, and then this past summer, as a deacon intern, right. I was in New Iberia, again with Father Blanda, and so over those five months that I was there to really uh, experience that through his priesthood, he's been a real mentor to me, and so it was an obvious choice um, mm -hmm. to have him vest me at right. the ordination this Saturday. Well, we know that Saturday is going to be a very busy day for you. That's Ordination right. in the morning, That's right. and you offer your first Holy Mass that afternoon or the, that evening. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also custom that we choose someone who um, is, is special to us in the priesthood to preach the first Mass. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, who will be doing that at your first Mass. Yeah, my first Mass will be Saturday in, in Broussard, and uh, the priest will be Father Jim Wayner. So he's okay. not a priest of this diocese. He's a priest of Pittsburgh but he's been serving as the rector at Notre Dame Seminary in New Orleans for the past four years. Mm -hmm. And so I've worked a lot with him. He's been a great mentor, taught me a lot. And so uh, I asked him to, to come in and, and preach my first Mass. Oh, great. And uh, so we hope that as, we're, uh, as this is being broadcast, we have young men who are watching, who are feeling perhaps the, mm -hmm. the tug of the Holy Spirit, sure. inviting them to think about priesthood. Very briefly, what kind of advice would you offer in O? Oh, about 20 seconds? Uh, I would say um, just relax. You know, I think we tr place our trust in the Lord. Uh, a lot of times there can be a lot of stress, this feeling I have to make a decision right now um, to kind of place our trust in the Lord and, and know that He will provide and He will make His will known to us and that He, he wants to fulfill our hearts and He will. Thank you, Deacon Reshore. We look forward to seeing what the Holy Spirit is going to do through uh, your priestly ministry, first at St. Mary Magdalene and then mm -hmm. many years later throughout our diocese. So. We thank you, Thanks. and we thank you, uh, people of Acadiana, for all of the years that you have prayed for Deacon Richard, Father Richard, and all of those 
ordained this year. We ask that you continue to keep all of our seminarians in your prayers, remembering them that they need your support for perseverance. Thank you, Father Bordelon and Father Richard. Coming up next in the segment, What It Means to be Catholic, Father Clinton Sensat is here for our Year of Mercy series. His talks are about indulgences. Good morning. My name is Father Clinton Sinsat, and I am the pastor of St. Thomas More Catholic Church and the chaplain of the LSUE Catholic Student Center. And as we've been going through these weeks discussing indulgences and the foundations of indulgences, today I wanted to talk about the reality of sin. Because sin is something that I think has disappeared from the minds of our Catholics today. We talk about it a lot, but I don't think we repent for it enough. And I'm not alone in thinking this. Pope St. John Paul II said that one of the greatest tragedies of modern man is that we've lost a sense of sin. That the idea of sin, the reality of sin has disappeared from our minds. And so what can that mean? We say we go to confession, we talk about sin, we ask God and the Our Father to forgive us our trespasses. What does it mean that we've lost a sense of sin when we start off every Mass by saying, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy? Well, I think we can say this, that one of the reasons why we've lost a sense of sin today, at least in my mind, crazy as it is, is because I think we've lost a sense of free will. So what do I mean by that? So many times, so many times, whenever I talk to people, they'll tell me about their children or their brother or their parents who are doing something wrong, not just in the eyes of the church, but in the eyes of God, in the eyes of truth. They're doing something wrong, but then they'll immediately tell me, Father, they just don't really know what they're doing. They don't really know what they're doing. I don't know that it takes that we really know what we're doing. We're not angels. We're human beings. We know enough. We know enough. And today we hear people constantly say that this person didn't really sin. This person didn't really make a commitment. This person didn't really get married. This person didn't really make a vow. So often today we seem to be collapsing more and more and more our human freedom, the reality that we make choices and that those choices matter. Because as I tell people all the time, if you get us to a place where our no to God means nothing, then our yes to God means nothing either. That if I never really sin, if I never really turn my back on God, if it's impossible for me because of all these different factors going on in my life to really sin, then it's impossible for me just as much to really say yes to God, to really follow God, to really be a saint. And I think we need to keep that in mind. So talking about the reality of sin, first I want to talk about the reality of our free will. We talked about God's will already. I want to talk about our free will now. So we have the ability to choose based on our thinking. We don't just choose based on our emotions. We don't just choose based on our past. We choose based on our thoughts. We decide whether we want to go to work or whether we want to sleep in. We decide whether we want to go to the beach on vacation or go to the mountains. We decide whether we want to read a book or watch television. All of this filters into our thinking. None of us says that I was forced to read a book. I was forced to watch television. We say we make choices. And the same is true in our moral life, that we make real choices, both for good and for evil. Both for good and for evil. And what does that look like? It looks like us recognizing in our mind, either guided by reason or guided by faith, as to what is true, what is good, what is right, what is our duty, or choosing what is pleasurable to me, what is preferable to me, what is convenient to me and easy for me, even when it is wrong. And do outside factors influence that choice? Sure. We're not angels. We're not supercomputers. 
We have emotions, we have a past, we have an environment in which we live, we have outside influences, both natural and supernatural. We're not angels, but we're also not animals. We're not compelled by our urges. We're not forced to do whatever we feel like doing. We have free will. And so that reality of free will enters into the reality of sin. And sin is certainly a mystery, as we hear in St. Paul's writings, the mystery of iniquity. It is a mystery, but it's not a completely unintelligible mystery. We can understand it. And that understanding is God has given us law. He's given us law in our nature to do what is in accordance with our nature because we're made in the image and likeness of God. He's given us law in Scripture so that we can know what is our supernatural goal, our supernatural good, what it means to have faith, what it means to have hope, what it means to have love. And he's given us the governance of the church to guide us and direct us. Guys, when we choose not to go to Mass, when we choose to live together outside of marriage, when we choose to practice greed and luxury, when we choose to oppress the poor, when we choose to violate the law of God written either in our nature or in our scripture, when we choose to do it, we've sinned. We've sinned. And I don't know about you, but I choose to do it sometimes. There are days when I'm frustrated. There are days whenever I'm tired. There are days whenever I'm sick of living the gospel. And I choose to sin. I don't like it. I can't excuse it. I must repent for it. Because sin is real. It can't be swept under the carpet. It can't be hidden behind curtains. We can't say none of us ever really know what we're doing. My brothers and sisters, we rebel against God. We choose against God. Sin is real. And we need to repent for it. I thank you all for joining me this day. Thank you, Father Sinsat. Coming up next, a highlight from the recent rite of ordination to the priesthood with Bishop Douglas Desitel. And now the time for ordination itself has come. Each of the candidates, one at a time, will approach Bishop Desitel will extend his hands and impart the sacrament of ordination. Draw near, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, author of human dignity. It is you who apportion all graces. Through you, everything progresses. Through you, all things are made to stand firm. To form a priestly people, you appoint ministers of Christ, your Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, arranging them in different orders. Already in the earlier covenant offices arose, established through mystical rites. When you set Moses and Aaron over your people to govern and sanctify them, you chose men next in rank and dignity to accompany them and assist them in their tasks. So too in the desert you implanted the spirit of Moses in the hearts of 70 wise men, and with their help he ruled your people with greater ease. So also upon the sons of Aaron you poured an abundant share of their father's plenty, that the number of the priests prescribed by the law might be sufficient for the sacrifices of the tabernacle, which were a shadow of the good things to come. But in these last days, Holy Father, you sent your Son into the world, Jesus, who is Apostle and High Priest of our confession. Through the Holy Spirit, he offered himself to you as a spotless victim, and he made his Apostles, consecrated in the truth, sharers in his mission. You provided them also with companions to proclaim and carry out the work of salvation throughout the whole world. And now we beseech you, Lord, in our weakness, to grant us these helpers that we need to exercise the priesthood that comes from the apostles. 
Grant, we pray, Almighty Father, to these your servants the dignity of the priesthood. Renew deep within them the spirit of holiness. May they henceforth possess this office which comes from you, O God, and is next in rank to the office of bishop. And by the example of their manner of life, may they instill right conduct. May they be worthy co-workers with our order, so that by their preaching and through the grace of the Holy Spirit, the words of the gospel may bear fruit in human hearts and reach even to the ends of the earth. <coughs> Together with us, may they be faithful stewards of your mysteries, so that your people may be renewed in the waters of rebirth and nourished from your altar, so that sinners may be reconciled and the sick raised up. May they be joined with us, Lord, in imploring your mercy for the people entrusted to their care and for all the world. And so may the full number of nations gathered together in Christ be transformed into your one people and made perfect in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. After the prayer of ordination, all are seated, and the newly ordained priests of Jesus Christ are vested in priest stoles and chasubles. As is custom, the newly ordained have chosen fellow priests who have impacted their discernment in discerning the call of Jesus to this ministry, vesting Father Albert is Father Michael Champagne. Father Patrick Whittingy is assisting Father Falk. And Father William Blanda is assisting Father Richard. And as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth A very special moment for the newly ordained as well as those vesting them, welcoming them to the order of the priesthood. The newly ordained priests will now approach Bishop Desitel, who will anoint their hands with sacred chrism. These hands that will celebrate mass, forgive sins and confession, anoint the sick and dying, and baptize the faithful. The Lord Jesus Christ, whom the Father anointed with the Holy Spirit, guard and preserve you so that you may sanctify the Christian people and offer sacrifice to God. The Lord Jesus Christ, whom the Father anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, guard and preserve you that you may sanctify the Christian people and offer sacrifice to God. The Lord Jesus Christ, whom the Father anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, guard and preserve you that you may sanctify the Christian people and offer sacrifice to God.
Thank you, Bishop Desitel. We hope you have enjoyed our program because it is produced for you. So please join us next week on this station as we tell the people about the Diocese of Lafayette and the good news of our Catholic faith.